Um, Exodus 32. We're going to spend the evening in one chapter, and it's really one of my favorite chapters. Um, so in Sunday school one morning, little Johnny, seven years old, was very focused on drawing something, and the teacher came up to Johnny and says, Johnny, what are you drawing? And Johnny says, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher thought this was a teachable moment, so she said, Johnny, nobody really knows what God looks like. And Johnny said, well, they will when I finish my picture. <laughs> that is a very good introduction to Exodus 32, in my humble opinion. Because what the golden calf is, and it took me a long time to realize this, it's man's attempt to draw a picture of what we think God looks like. That's what the golden calf is. That's what every golden calf is. And whether it's an idol or whether it's even theolo theology is our attempt to define what God looks like. But whenever we make an image of what we think God looks like, there's a term for that in the Bible. <laughs> it's called idolatry. Because God defines himself. And that's what he's doing in the Exodus. He's trying to introduce himself. Because if we try to imagine what God looks like, like Johnny, we, we just get it wrong every time. Okay? I haven't even read the Bible yet. And you're already... You're already let's start with Ruth. Ruth had her hand up. Oh, let's hold on to that. I, I don't know what to do. The question was, what about pictures of Jesus? Let's, uh, Jim, what, were you going that, down that road? or? Oh, <laughs> okay. And some of you may, may have heard me teach on Exodus 32. I don't know if I did it at Ruggles this summer or not, but it's, it's such a powerful, it's so relevant for where we are. But let me read the, the whole chapter. I've got the English Standard Version, but let's get the whole chapter in front of us. It really goes with chapters 33 and 34 as well, but we're not going to get to that. We're just going to camp in chapter 32. And incidentally, last week we looked at the tabernacle, which comes in the five chapters before this, chapters 26 to 31, and then in chapters 35 to 40, it's all about the tabernacle. That is how to worship the Holy One. God is telling us, how do you live with holiness? How do you live with the Holy One? Exodus 32 is how not to. So the context is, is very interesting, and it's quite a contrast. Here we go. Incidentally, I can't get started. This is six weeks after the wedding. So the wedding we saw two weeks ago, talked about the covenant at Mount Sinai, and we talked about it as a wedding. In a wedding, you make vows to one another. So six weeks after the wedding, the bride is committing adultery with the bull. It just doesn't get uglier than that. But I just, it's right here in the book. I don't make this stuff up. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, So Pastor Aaron, he's their pastor, Up, make us gods. And if you know your Bible, the word gods there is Elohim. It's a good Hebrew word for God, and it's in the plural. So depending on how your translation translates it. But make us gods who shall go before us. As for this fellow Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. He's up there on the mountain talking to the cloud, talking to immortal, invisible, in light, inaccessible. That God scares us. We want a God that's more user-friendly. I made that part up. Verse 2. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, 
your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from them and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. So this is their pastor making a golden calf for them. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So the one who parted the Red Sea, the one who put the blood over the doorpost, the God of the ten plagues, the God who gives us manna. We're not worshiping an Egyptian God or a Canaanite God. We're worshiping the God who redeemed us. We're just, like Johnny, drawing his picture the way we think he looks. You getting it? For years I thought they broke the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. It's not the first commandment they're breaking, it's the second one. Don't make of the true God a graven image. Don't do what Johnny was doing. Don't try to design God. You'll get it wrong every time. I promise you. <laughs> you just ask one. Okay, that, that's true. And Aaron has been to seminary. That's right. So they, the people are saying, make us Elohim, make us just sort of a God, a generic term for deity. But Aaron says, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar and Aaron made proclamation, tomorrow shall be a feast to who? To Yahweh, yet when you see the word LORD in all caps, that is the personal name for God. The name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush that we saw quite a few weeks ago. So that's not a generic term, title. That is God's personal name. Aaron's been to seminary. So I am making a golden image of Yahweh. It's like Aaron... This is serious. Seminary can get you in trouble. I'm looking at the seminarians in the room, and there are several of us. It's uh, okay. Let, let me keep reading. Let, let me keep. Well, he asked for the plural gods, and he made them one. Okay, but the word Elohim in our Bibles is sometimes translated sing, as a singular god. It's it's the it's the the plural of royalty. It's, the, it's sort of like Queen Elizabeth saying, it is our good pleasure. You know, what do you mean our? Well, she's the queen, so she's... Uh, it's, it's a deeper question than that, but, but hold it. Okay, verse 6. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the word play in the Old Testament often has sexual connotations. It's the word that when Abimelech saw Isaac sporting with his wife. <laughs> you have to love the, the Bible, sport, playing. But he saw Isaac and his wife together intimately, Abimelech. That's Genesis, if you want to look, 26 verse 8. But it's the same word play. So for worship, as they're around this golden calf, they're eating, they're drinking, there's some sort of sexuality going on. A little later we're going to see there's dancing and they're singing. They're worshiping. And I'm sure when they went home from church, they said, Pastor Aaron, great worship today. <laughs> great worship. I mean, it was, it was, we had a wonderful time in worship. What does it mean when people leave church and say, great worship? That question, very interesting. And I'm going to keep going. Try not to stop me. Verse 7. And the Lord said to Moses. Now Moses is up on the mountain. Literally, he is between a holy God and a sinful nation. So Moses is up on this mountain. He's interceding. He's in the gap. God in His holiness, 
Israel in their sinfulness, and Moses is right in the middle. Don't miss the power of that. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people, who you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. See the pronouns there? They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They've made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, leave me alone. <laughs> what do you do if God tells you, leave me alone? It's like, that my wrath may burn against them, and that I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. That whole passage just sort of messes with my theology. <laughs> um, I've always said, if you want to mess up your theology, read the Bible. And I really do mean that. But God's upset. He's the husband. He's made vows to his bride. She's in bed with the bull. And adultery is grounds for divorce. And God is considering it. Okay? You guys are fun. You're follow I can tell you're following me. Verse 11. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people who you brought out of the land of Egypt? You hear, the, you hear the argument? God says, they're your people. Moses says, not so fast, big guy. They're your people, and you brought them out. And I have to say this respectfully, but Moses is right on this one. <laughs> Moses, they are God's people, and Moses knows it. But this is intercessory prayer. This is, okay. Verse 12. Why should the Egyptians say... With evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth. Remember the Egyptians, Lord? Remember Pharaoh? Remember the ten plagues? What are they going to say in Egypt when all these people die in the wilderness? The Egyptians are going to say, see, he's just another national deity, tribal deity. They come and they go. You want them to say that about you in Egypt? God loves it when we remind him of his glory among the nations. Turn from your burning anger. I'm at the end of verse 12. And what word do you have? Relent. Anybody got another translation? Change. Does anybody have the authorized King James Version? What does the New King James say? Relent. It says relent. The word is repent. And most of the translate, it's the same word that's used of what sinners do when they turn. It's the same word. You check, you check it out. Or go get your Strong's Concordant and just check the numbers. It'll match up. But he's telling God to repent. Now, I don't have a problem when God tells a rascal like Moses, Moses, you need to repent. But when a rascal like Moses tells God that God needs to repent, I mean, that, that messes with my theology. Repent from this disaster against your people or change your mind. Relent. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven, and all this land that I've promised I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob 400 years ago when you promised them you were going to bring these people to Canaan. Were you lying? Don't you keep your promises? I've been to a lot of intercessory prayer meetings. I've never heard anybody pray like this to God. I've never prayed like this to God. And I want to, don't try this unless you're very good friends with God. Like Moses. He knew God face to face like a friend. You can talk to your friend like this. 
But if you don't know God well, I would encourage you, don't, don't try this at home. You might get hurt. <laughs> okay? How are we doing? Verse 14, and the Lord repented. It's the word. The Lord changed his mind from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Let's keep going. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back. They were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on tablets. When Joshua heard the sound of the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There's a noise of war in the camp. But Moses said, It's not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat. It's the sound of worship music. It's singing. They're worshiping. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. He threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Now, he's not just having a temper tantrum. This is an acted parable. This is the covenant that he holds in his hand. You commit adultery, you break the covenant. It's grounds for divorce, at least potentially. The covenant is off. Maybe. <laughs> You follow this? I can't tell you how dramatic this passage is. And he broke them at the foot of the mountain. Verse 20. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire, ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the people drink it. I mean, Moses is upset. Now, and remember, Moses, uh, Aaron is Moses' big brother. So Aaron and Moses are siblings. So you got big brother, little brother stuff going on here too. Verse 21. And Moses said to his little brother, or excuse me, to his big brother, to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you've brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know these people, how they're set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. So I said to them, Let any of you have gold and take it off. So they gave it to me. I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. That has got to be one of the greatest clergy quotes in human history. It's like, come on, he, what, what, what a wimp. I mean, he, he, he won't take responsibility. 25, when Moses saw that the people had broken loose because Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on Yahweh's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi, gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother, his companion, and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you've been ordained. This would be a great ordination sermon. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's powerful. You've been ordained for the service of Yahweh, each one at the cost of his son, his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. The next day Moses said to the people, You've sinned a great sin. Now I will go up to the Lord, perhaps... I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They've made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will, forgive their sin. But if not, 
please blot me out of your book that you've written. I've never prayed that prayer. I confess. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned, I will blot out of my book. Just pause on that a moment. Are our names written in the Lamb's book of life in pencil? <laughs> Can he blot out a name that he wrote in the book? And again, I'm just reading the text. I'm just reading the text and letting it speak to us. I, I don't know what to do with all this. But the Lord said, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf, the calf that Aaron, Pastor Aaron, had made. That is an incredible chapter. That is an incredible chapter. Okay, you got your papers? Let's see what we can do. We got 30 minutes. Let's see how far we can get. Trouble in the camp. Just six weeks after the wedding ceremony, the bride is in bed with another lover committing adultery with a bull. Ever since Sinai, it seems there has always been a lot of bull in church. I preached this sermon actually in Kenya one time and I realized that the, the, the idiom of a lot of bull, you know, which we, it works well in English, I said, that's not going to work in another culture. So I looked up in the dictionary, look at my footnote, just what, does, what are the secondary definitions of bull? The English dictionary includes the following secondary definitions of the word bull. Nonsense, absurdity, insanity, Stupidity, baloney, hypocrisy, hogwash, balderdash, and flapdoodle. I have no idea what flapdoodle is, but I don't want to be guilty of committing flapdoodle. I know it's not good. And then I said, plus some words my mother taught me never to use. But the reason we can talk about bull in church is not just because of what may or may not be happening in the contemporary church, but it's biblical. It starts right here at Mount Sinai, six weeks after the covenant was ratified, one of the greatest moments in history. There's bull in church. Um, and there's certainly bull in church in the New Testament. B, we will never get out of the desert. What we're doing on Tuesday nights is taking a journey, the geography of salvation. So we got out of Egypt. We crossed the Red Sea. We've gone three months into the desert. We're at Sinai. We'll never get out of the desert and into Canaan until we learn how to deal with sin in the redeemed. Not sin in the lost. It's one thing when Egyptians sin or Canaanite sin. We're talking about redeemed people that sin. What do you do? Uh, I, I actually pulled down my Wesley sermons this morning, and Wesley's 13th sermon, I knew I could find it somewhere, out of his 52 standard sermons, is entitled, On Sin and Believers. Pastor John Wesley this was a very important subject. You can pick it up. In, and his second one is on repentance of believers. So in other words, sin is not just something I struggled with back before I got out of Egypt. What do I do when I struggle with sin and I've been redeemed by the Passover blood, by the waters of the Red Sea? Every day I eat manna and yet there's still bull in my life. Great. I'm so glad you asked. I'm so glad you asked. That's a very important question. After experiencing the blood of the Passover lamb, the waters of baptism, and the vows of the covenant, is there no cure for sin? Is this story of the golden calf a picture of the normal Christian life? Is Romans 7 as good as it gets? <laughs> is there no bomb in Gilead? 
Um, I've got to keep moving, but that, those are huge questions. C. Moses breaks the tablets. This is not a temper tantrum, but a symbolic action. Adultery is a great sin and potentially grounds for divorce. God is on the verge of blotting out names from His book. And like I say, how does that fit into your theology? Can God do that? If you married me, would you divorce me? <laughs> I, would you, if you put my name in your book, can you take it out? Again, I'm just asking the questions. I've got opinions on these things like you've got opinions on these things. But I just want the scriptures to let the word, like what Spurgeon used to say, just open the lion's cage and let the word loose. Just let it loose. Just let it do what the word does. D, so what happened? The people somehow developed a false view of God and salvation. This meant they were putting their trust in a false gospel. And their spiritual leader, Pastor Aaron, went along with them. This is pastoral malpractice of the worst kind. The people were out of Egypt, but Egypt was not out of the people, including Pastor Aaron. They worshiped bulls down in Egypt. They worshiped bulls up in Canaan. Can't we worship our God in the form of a bull? You're thinking like an Egyptian. And you'll do laps in the wilderness. You'll never get out of the desert until you learn how to live with the Holy One who doesn't like bull in church. <laughs> God gets really upset when there's bull in church. How are we doing? We doing okay? Okay. Three characteristics of a false gospel. Let me uh, just, what I, what I find in this passage. A. You may have bull in church, A, if the clergy follow the people rather than lead the people. So the people come to Pastor Aaron and they say, Pastor Aaron, make us a bull. They can pack out churches down in Egypt and up in Canaan when people worship in the form of a bull. The people want, number one, contemporary worship. <laughs> now, I'm choosing my words. I'm not on a crusade tonight. Well, I, maybe I am, but I'm not trying to make a contemporary worship point, except there is a line. The people want contemporary worship. Egypt worships a bull. His name is Apis. So do the Canaanites. His name is Baal. Study how often the bull appears in the Bible. They want worship that is seeker-sensitive, market-driven, culturally relevant. Why are you smiling? What are you thinking? I, I shouldn't put you on the spot. This... It's because I've been a pastor and I've been a part of Bull in Church. I've been Aaron. I know Aaron very well, unfortunately. I feel sorry for Aaron. Pastors are typically nice people who want to please their people. That's why they go into this profession. So if your people come and says, can't we have worship that's more like the world? Do we have to go back to the 18th century and sing four-part harmonies to to worship. Can't we bring the world into the church? It's a very good thing when a boat is in water. It's a very bad thing when water is in the boat. It's a very good thing when the church is in the world. That's where it's supposed to be. It's a very bad thing when the world is in the church. It, 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 it gets real fuzzy. And uh, 
I mean, I lived through, we built a new sanctuary when I was in New York, and we, in that moment, put drums on the platform. <laughs> you know, <laughs> drums on the platform. Okay, is that wrong? I don't think so. I don't think it is at all. But where, where are you going? And I may have said this here a few weeks ago, but I sort of hit a wall one time. And this, you don't have to be where I am on this. But when I was visiting a church, it wasn't the one I was pastoring, and they used a smoke machine in worship. And I said to myself, do we really need a smoke machine? I mean, what, where are we? And I, I just sort of said, I'm, I can't take this sitting down. There's a line that can be crossed, and it's subtle. And we always cross these lines for good reasons. There's nothing want to be seeker sensitive. That's not a bad thing. You want to be sensitive to seekers. To be market driven, at least in the sense that you want the church to feel relevant, to be culturally astute. Those are not wicked things. But when you bring bull in church, and when you do what Johnny does, I'm going to design God like I think God is supposed to look. You guys are really good. I'm enjoying this. You're li- and I want, I want you to think with. Okay, let me keep going. Two, Aaron thinks his job is to reflect public opinion rather than shape it. I think Aaron was a pastor like this. He would wet his finger and say, where's the wind blowing? And as long as the congregation is voting, you know, 60, 70, 80 percent in support of me, I must be doing it right. It's like, don't think like that. That's, the church is not a democracy. I hope you know that. The church is an autocracy. There is a king. And there are boundaries. Now, where they are, we can debate. But Aaron, your job is not to reflect the culture. Your job is to change the culture. I uh, said it this way. Um, he is supposed to be a thermometer. No, he, he is a thermometer when God has called him to be a thermostat. I like that. They look alike on the wall. A thermometer and a thermostat look alike from a distance. It's like, well, and they sort of do similar kinds of things, but there's a world of difference. And when a pastor becomes a thermometer... Just reflecting his congregation. Houston, we have a problem. I changed my metaphors there. (laughs) Sorry. Okay. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you've heard me talk about. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor in Germany in the 1930s when Adolf Hitler became the chancellor. And all of the clergy in the Lutheran church swore an oath of allegiance to the Fuhrer. And they basically were saying, well, he says he's a Christian. He's good for the economy. (laughs) We're restoring national pride. And we are Lutherans. Can't we sign this oath? And Bonhoeffer and a few others said it's evil. It's evil. I will not sign. And people laughed at him and they said, what's wrong with you? Get with it. And he, and he basically said, I'm not a thermometer, I'm a thermostat. I wish every pastor in America read the book Bonhoeffer by Eric Metaxas. It is because that's the world we're living in. Three, as Adam blamed Eve... Remember God, after they ate the forbidden fruit, comes to the head of the family, Adam. Says, Adam, what happened here? He said, don't look at me. It's that woman you gave me. It's like, are you kidding, Adam? Man up. Uh, As Adam blamed Eve, so Pastor Aaron passes the buck. Pastor, what's going on? Don't look at me. It's these stupid sheep. You know, they... 
It's like, what kind of leader are you? Aaron passes the buck and blames the people for what happened. What a wimp. He refuses to take responsibility, but God holds Aaron fully responsible. You reread the text, and God puts his finger in the pastor's chest and says, you're responsible for what's going on in this church. Nothing's more terrifying for a pastor than to realize, I, I've got to discern truth. And Four, pastors must stop trying to entertain the goats and get back to the job of feeding the sheep. I didn't come up with that originally, but that is a great quote. And that's sort of what I wanted to say at this smoke machine church. Would you please stop entertaining the goat? Your sheep are starving. They're sitting all around me. Would you give them something to eat? Okay, I get worked up on this. Can I keep going? So one characteristic or one evidence that you may have bull in church is if the clergy follow the people rather than lead the people. Number two, you may have bull in church if B, we make God in our image rather than allowing God to make us or remake us in His image. It's little Johnny drawing a picture of what he thinks God looks like. The sin of Exodus 32 is not a violation of the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. They weren't changing gods. They were worshiping the God who brought them out of Egypt. They're very specific about that. We're not changing gods. We just want a graven image of our God. And that's the second commandment, which I've never really understood. The first one I sort of get. The second one has always been hard. What does it mean to make a graven image? Well, it means to do what Johnny was doing. For you to define God according to your criteria. God said, and and you, you can, theologians do that. This is what God looks like, I'll tell you. And we write our theologies. Uh, it's what maybe the... Have you seen the movie The Shack? I haven't seen the movie yet. Uh, and I, I really like the shack. I mean, I may get in trouble for this, but it, it's really risky business what he's doing there because he's telling you what God looks like. And he's putting literally faces and gender and ethnicities on Father, Son, and Spirit. And uh, it, it's powerful, but it's like, whoa, I, I, it's, it's sort of right on the edge of, is that good? Is that bad? Um, yeah, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Number two, Aaron and the people are not worshiping another god. They are worshiping the god who brought them out of Egypt, named Yahweh. They just want to worship him like they worship in Egypt and Canaan. The word to describe this is... Anybody want to take a stab at what do you, What do you call it when you bring worldly or pagan elements into the true the truth excellent who said that is that David excellent syncretism that's what that's my understanding syncretism is a mixture of true religion and false religion I remember in seminary Dr. Wong uh, Joseph Wong he was so good but he would repeat over and over, a half-truth is more dangerous than a lie. It's better just to go to, ba to Canaan and start worshiping Baal, just worship Baal, than to worship the God who brought you out of Egypt the way you think he's supposed to be worshipped. That is more toxic than Baal. I, and I think that's right. I think that's right. And syncretism is when we mix. Somebody said syncretism, it's like mixing dog food with a meal from Olive Garden. The only one happy is the dog. That's a very good analogy, I think. 
So that's what's happening at the golden calf. It's partly true. That's why it's so toxic. And that's why God says, I want a divorce, I think. You have violated the very spirit of the covenant. Number three, here's a quote from William Temple, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and I've never been able to track this down. Dennis Kenlaw quotes this a lot if you read Kenlaw stuff, but I've never seen him reference where it comes from originally. But it's a great quote. If your concept of God is wrong, then the more religious you become, the more dangerous you become to yourself and others. So if I'm in church with my hands raised, feeling goosebumps, because I'm really connecting with the music and with what's happening, but my, I'm worshiping my concept of what I think God looks like rather than who God truly is, then the more I worship that concept, the more off base I get. I wonder how much of that is going on in the American evangelical church where we're very excited about worship. But worship of who? I learned when people said, great worship, Pastor Stan, love the worship today, what they usually mean is, I liked the music. You did bluegrass music today, and I love bluegrass music, so that really connects. Like, what, is, what does that have to do with worship? Or four-part harmony, is that more holy than 20th century pop? I, I, don't, I don't think so. But where did we get this notion that worship and music are synonyms? But, okay. Number four. There is a huge difference between worshiping God as He is and worshiping your concept of God. I, uh, it's a little bit like the difference between um, a lightning bug and a lightning bolt. <laughs> They're almost alike. You spell them almost alike. They almost sound alike. But I submit to you there's a difference between a lightning bug and a lightning bolt. And there's a difference between worshiping your concept of God and worshiping God. If we ever hope to get out of the desert and into the land of promise, we must have a right concept of God and worship Him in the right way. You've got to worship the right God in the right way. And that's what the tabernacle is all about. There's one door. There's the altar of sacrifice. There's the laver of cleansing. There's the holy place. There's the lampstand. There's the veil. There's the curtain. There's the most holy place. That's the God we're trying to worship. And you can't just wander into his presence and say, yeah. Note how this false worship is inserted in the broader context of proper worship. Yeah, I just, uh, number five, in the New Testament, we learn of another dramatic example of inappropriate worship, and it's Ananias and Sapphira. Don't think that this is just Old Testament stuff that we don't have to worry about anymore. It was during the offering, having worship at church on Sunday morning, that Ananias and Sapphira just said a little lie to the Holy Spirit, and they fell out right dead in the... I all had the ushers had to step over them when they were passing the offering plates. There were bodies in the aisle. <laughs> anyway, I threw in that part. C, you may have bull in church. C, when you begin to think that the purpose of redemption is to make us happy rather than holy. What J.I. Packer calls hot tub religion. It's a great, I wish I'd have thought of that, hot tub religion. It's like, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Bad theology always leads to immorality. And three, we resemble what we worship. If you worship a bull, 
you'll start to act like a bull. But if you worship the Holy One, you will become holy. You cannot worship the Holy One without becoming holy. If you say, well, we do it at my church all the time. I want to say, well, that's probably because you're worshiping your concept of God, not God as He is. The gospel's purpose is not to make us healthy, wealthy, and happy, but to make us holy. Jesus came to save us from our sins, not leave us in them. He wants to do more than take us out of Egypt. He wants to deliver us from our Egyptian nature. He wants to take Egypt out of us. C.S. Lewis says in one of his lectures, he said, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of whiskey would do that. And then he says, if you want a religion that makes you happy, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. <laughs> I really like that. Now, joy is different than happiness. But there's a lot of people on a lot of pews, on a lot of Sunday mornings, and they get the impression that the reason Jesus died on the cross is so I can be happy, healthy, wealthy, and happy. Bull in church. Um, Roman numeral number three uh, is how should godly leadership deal with the false gospel? And A is the answer, intercession. Moses goes up on the mountain and talks to a holy God about a sinful nation. And then he goes down to the people and talks to a sinful nation about a holy God. And he's shuttle diplomacy. He's just back and forth, up and down the mountain. He's interceding. But let's skip Roman numeral 3. Okay, you can... Uh, I think the answers are online. If not, I'll... come. Are y'all going to be frustrated if I... You're frustrated already. All right, here, here are the answers. I'll, let me give them to you. And um, Intercession must be made. Someone must stand in the gap between a holy God and a sinful nation. While Aaron is down in the valley leading the people into sin, Moses is up on the mountain interceding. One, the nature of intercession, it's a wrestling match. Moses and God... I think they're shouting at each other. <laughs> I think Moses, the veins on his neck are standing out. And he's saying, they're your people who you brought out of Egypt. And God is saying, I don't want them. They're your people. You brought them out of Egypt. And there's this, it's like Jacob wrestling the angel. That messes with my theology. And again, I've been to a lot of prayer meetings. I don't hear people talk to God like this. But Moses knew God as a man knows a friend. Friends talk like this to each other. Spouses talk like this to each other. It doesn't mean a, it's not necessarily a bad thing. They're just trying to work it out. Just, we just got to work this out. But it's true intercession is a wrestling match. The power, number two, the power of intercession is causing God to repent or change his mind. And those are inflammatory words. And I threw in Numbers 23, verse 19, which just to make it interesting, the Bible says God is not a man that he should repent. God doesn't repent. But then there's about five places in the Bible where it says God does repent. This is why I love the Bible. It's like, well, make up your mind. Do you repent or do you not repent? But it's not a contradiction. It's just living in the tension of a personal relationship. And I think every parent of a teenager understands this intuitively. Do I kill them? <laughs> or do I put my arms around them and hug them? Because I'm, I'm... And it changed between breakfast and lunch, how I feel, you know. Every parent of a teenager understands what God feels when it's going on. And God's a person. I mean, He's personal. There's a... Those bullets, there's at least three other places where uh, it says God repents. Genesis 6.6, 6, 
is when in the King James, God says, It repenteth me that I made man. In other words, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know, what was I thinking when I made them? And he sends a flood and wipes them all out. It's like 1 Samuel 15 is where God says, I repent that I made Saul king. And that's the word he uses. I made him king. What was I thinking? My favorite is Jonah. <laughs> Jonah is the funniest book in the Bible. If you're not chuckling when you finish Jonah, you didn't read it right. Um, I'll tell you the story. So God says to his prophet Jonah, Jonah, go to Nineveh, preach a sermon, 40 days, you're going to burn. Jonah gets in a boat and goes the other direction. <laughs> God sends a whale gram to get Jonah's attention. Jonah sits in whale gastric juice for three days at the bottom of the ocean, thinking about the consequences of disobeying God. And finally he says, all right, I'll go already. He makes the whale nauseated. Prophets often have that effect on people. So the whale vomits up the prophet onto the beach. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. Go to Nineveh. Tell them 40 days they're going to fry. So dutifully pouting all the way, Jonah goes off to Nineveh, goes right to the city of the town, stands up, and he says, 40 days you're going to burn. Let's stand for the benediction. <laughs> That's his sermon. Next verse. The Ninevites repent. Next verse. God repents <laughs> and says, okay, you repented. I'm not going to destroy the city. Next verse, Jonah goes out, sits under a tree, and pouts. And God says to Jonah, what are you doing here, Jonah? And Jonah says, I knew you were going to do that. That's why I ran away. That's the kind of God you are. You change your mind. And God just says, Jonah, of all people, do you have a right to be upset at my mercy? End of the book. It's a wonderful story. It's like, what does that mean, God? It's just like, this is real stuff. The content of intercession, number three, is your glory is at stake. I think God loved it when Moses said, God, remember the Egyptians? And I think God says, yeah, because I love the Egyptians. I'm trying to save the Egyptians, too. By saving the Hebrews is how I save, reach the Egyptians. So when we remind God of the nations, and the second bullet is your promises. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What you promised them? Do you, don't you keep your promises? Number four, the cost of intercession. If you will not forgive their sin, then please blot me out. And in Romans 9 there, Paul prayed very similarly uh, when he prayed for his nation, the Jews. He said, I could wish myself accursed for my kinsmen, the Jews. It's like, and number five, the rarity of intercession. God is looking for just one. Two million sinners down in the valley worshiping a bull. And one man interceding. Just one. Just one. God is looking for just one who will stand in the gap. Ezekiel 22, I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But in Ezekiel's days that I couldn't find one. How else do you respond to bull in the church after intercession? B, the idol must be destroyed. He ground it to powder, mixed it with water, made the people drink it. <laughs> C, atonement must be made. And then D, a decision is called for. Who is on the Lord's side? It's such a dramatic passage. 
Okay, we got two minutes. Uh, three powerful truths. I'm just going to give you the A, B, C, okay? A, sin remains, but it must not reign. After redemption, we are sinners, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. But though sin remains, it doesn't have to reign. I'm not sure I've said that the best here, but this is a... We're, it, it's getting at it. The, um, what the New Testament calls the flesh. It's the middle there. B. And I really, this is what spoke to me this morning when I was preparing for you guys tonight. There are two kinds of sin. Let me read you this middle paragraph. It comes from Numbers 15. If one person sins unintentionally, He shall offer a female goat a year old for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement before the Lord for the person who makes a mistake. So there are sins that are mistakes, or they're unintentional. Or it's like I do something wrong, and then I say, Oh, Lord, what, what's wrong with me? Why did I do that? Please help me and forgive me. Now look, uh, after the three dots... But the person who does anything with a high hand. And when you think of a high hand, I think, think of a raised fist. God. Defiantly, willfully, deliberately, whether he's a native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord. That person shall be cut off from among his people. He has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity is on him. In other words, there's no lamb to put it on. He's going to carry his iniquity because he's shaking his fist at God, saying, I know what you say, but curse you, I'm not going to do what you want. That's what's going on with the golden... The, the golden calf. The, col the sin with the golden calf was a high-handed sin, willful, premeditated, brazen, continual. It was of a nature that created the potential for divorce and for falling from grace. Listen to how Hebrews talks about this. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment, a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. And see, we're done, but the meaning of ordination. Well, one, two, three. What does it mean to be ordained to the ministry? One, to be able to discern right from wrong. The pastor is supposed to be, this is clean, this is unclean. This is right, this is wrong. This is good, this is evil. Aaron failed totally. B, a pastor should, uh, in ordination means to be ready to implement church discipline or spiritual discipline even on your friends and family. That's what the Levites did. And three, know how to intercede, to stand in the gap. I gave you way too much information tonight, but that's uh, Exodus 32 is uh, incredibly rich. Next week... Um, we're going to be in the book of Numbers because we've been at Sinai for three weeks. We got the covenant, we got the tabernacle, and then we're learning how to deal with sin in the believer, bull in church. What do you do when there's bull in church? But once these things are done, the pillar of fire starts to move and it's heading north toward promised land a place called Kadesh Barnea.
It's an 11 day journey, not 40 years, 11 days. Yeah, it's really a good story, and it's our story. I mean, it's. Lord, thank you tonight. It's been so, so good to just sit with people we love and uh, just try to absorb and listen and learn. Forgive us for those times we've tried to dis- dis- uh, picture you and make a graven image. And would you reveal yourself to us as you truly are and help us to worship you as you truly are. Dismiss us now with your blessing and keep teaching us. Make us receptive. Make us teachable, we pray. Keep us safe even as we return to our homes and bring us back again next week. In Jesus' name and for the sake of the kingdom, amen. See ya. Um, Yes. Um, Gorsuch. Gorsuch.